This is Dan Schneider, and on this edition of the Dan Schneider Video Interview, I will be talking with a man named Harold Wright. He is a poet and a translator. He's a storyteller, and he's been doing it for quite a few decades. And the next hour or so, I will be talking with him about his career in literature and out. As I mentioned, uh, I am speaking with Harold Wright, and I first came upon uh, Harold's uh, work uh, 30 or so years ago with a book called The Selected Poems of Shintaro Tanakawa, a Japanese poet of quite worth, and it was a book published by, I think, a now defunct press, the North Point Press, which was actually a good poetry press. So welcome, Harold, and uh, just for people who may never have heard of you, uh, if you could give take a few minutes and just tell us a little bit about yourself, your life, where you grew up, how you got interested in arts, poetry, and uh, your career. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I'm from Dayton, Ohio. I, was, I grew up in Dayton, Ohio. I worked in construction work. My dad was in construction work. And uh, the... Uh, I was interested in poetry uh, from high school. One of the reasons I was dyslexic, and uh, I found out that uh, uh, reading was very difficult for me. So when I was doing my lessons in school, I always looked for shorter things, uh, shorter stories, poetry and so forth. So I really enjoyed uh, poetry. And then when I could hear somebody read it, uh, like a teacher with a good voice, I just loved the sounds of it. And so that really fell in love with poetry, like, like in high school. Uh, then I uh, joined the Navy. I was about to be drafted. I didn't want to be drafted, so I joined the Navy. And uh, they sent me first to New Orleans. And I was stationed in New Orleans. And I had a job at the Federal Building at the 8th Naval District. And there uh, I was able to live off uh, base on the, in the French Quarter. And there I actually met some real poets. And that, was very, that was very exciting. What, what so, year was this, Harold? Was this uh, during uh, the 50s? Uh, 1951, I joined the Navy. So 1951-52. Okay. Uh, in the uh, French Quarter. Yeah. It was a wild place back then. Right? Yeah. Let me talk about that. Okay. So uh, after about a year in New Orleans, uh, decided that we're going to do something else. Anyway, I ended up in surveyor school because of my construction background. And so I then I went to surveyor school in the Navy, and they assigned me to the construction battalion, the Seabees, the fighting Seabees. Well, I didn't know where I was going to be sent, and uh, I thought maybe Korea, maybe Guam or someplace, but they sent me to Japan. Huh. And a little bit disappointed at first because uh, I, that didn't sound very exciting. I mean, we already beat them in a war. I, I didn't understand why I was going there. But anyway, I ended up for the next three years in Japan totally Love the place, love the people, love the sake. <laughs> and one day I was walking through the mountains and I wondered what kind of poetry the Japanese wrote. I had uh, never heard of haiku or tonko or anything like that. So I went to a bookstore and in broken Japanese asked him, you have a book of Japanese poetry? Uh, and he figured out what I was trying to say and found a book, which I still have, uh, that had the Tanaka poems from the Manush in it. It was some of the oldest poetry. It was a bilingual edition by uh, somebody who went by the name of Shilson uh, Yasuda. Later he became uh, Kenneth Yasuda and he was teaching in Indiana. I got to know him pretty well. But anyway, this was a very early translation and so I was reading these Tonka poems. I loved those Tonka poems. They were short, for one thing. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so uh, anyway, I went around and uh, I tried to get my friends to read them to me in Japanese. And uh, we could read them, but they couldn't decipher them. And they said the language was too old. And I couldn't understand that. And anyway, I had a vow at that time that I was going to learn to read this language. And I was trying to find out what those poems, those beautiful little poems, said in the original. And uh, in the meantime, uh, based on the translation, I began to write these Tonka poems in English. I wrote my own version of uh, English. I began to uh, I write them. And so that became kind of a, a poetic form for me, this Tonka in English. So 1952, 1952, 3, 4, I was in Japan. Tonka poems. 
I still love Tonka. Uh, and for those people who don't know, Tonka poems are basically elongated haiku. Haikus are five, seven, five syllables, and then the Tonka just adds seven and seven syllables. Yeah, that, that is correct. That is, that is correct. And it's much older than the, uh, the more recent uh, uh, haiku poem. Yeah. So what happened when I got out of the, uh, when I got about to be discharged, I decided I was going to live in Japan. Uh, I, I didn't really want to come back to the United States. I knew Lafcadio Hearn, the famous uh, yeah. poet and so forth. He lived in Japan, translated this stuff, and had a wonderful life. And I thought, I can do that too. Yeah. And so I tried to get discharged in Japan, but the commanding officer uh, listened to my plea to be translated to discharge in Japan. He said, it's a very unusual request. Uh, most people want to get home as soon as they can. He said, but I will consider it. But then I made a fatal mistake. Uh, when leaving his office, I bowed to him instead of saluting. He said, damn it, right, you've been over here too long anyway. We're sending you home. <laughs> yeah, and for those who don't know, Lafcadio Hearn was a turn of the 20th century uh, uh, American who lived in Japan. Of, uh, early into the English language. So he was quite a major figure. And, uh, you know, he uh, also uh, influenced a lot of early Japanese film, too, with translations of uh, what is the most famous? Um, oh. uh, well, let, me look, let me look it up. But go ahead. Keep, keep going, Harold. Yeah, yes. OK. Yeah. So he, he, did, uh, he was very famous for his ghost tales. Yeah. Uh, Kwai Don, which, uh, right, that's uh, right, Kwai Don, yeah, that's right. Kwai Don made a, uh, was, became a very uh, popular movie, so we're good. Yeah, he's uh, translating ghost tales. And actually, uh, I really became interested in those kind of things very, very early, because as I was running around Japan uh, with uh, my friends, drinking sake and sake houses and so forth, uh, people would tell me uh, uh, folk tales and ghost tales and things like that. And I was interested in those kind of things, as well as poetry. Yeah. Uh, so but, when, when, that one, that, uh, when people, uh, when I show my little book of uh, poems, people, uh, you know, they had, uh, the, uh, people, the Japanese people were very interested in poetry. When I told them I wrote poetry, I was respected for that. A poet, ah, she didn't. Uh, and uh, so uh, I realized that uh, this was a place I was very comfortable. Uh, it was a land of poets. Yeah. And one time I got, I got to add the, the little story. I was on a construction. I was on a uh, riverbank, writing poetry, and a drunken construction worker come, comes down the the, the road, and uh, he was really drunk and really kind of really wondering what I was doing, and he yelled over at me and said, "What are you doing over there?" And I said, "I'm writing a poem." Uh, no, back at a high, probably a fight or something on him. But he came over and he said, "Give me that notebook." He took my notebook. And he wrote, scribbled something down there, and he said, haiku, ah, that's a haiku. And I thought, this is really an amazing country. You had a drunken construction worker to write poetry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how, how did you get back to the States, and how, what, what were some of the first uh, works that you translated into English when you got back to the States? Yeah, so, okay, let me, let me uh, continue with that. Uh, so I did get uh, sent back to... Uh, uh, to the United States, got discharged, went back to Ohio, worked at construction for a while. Then caught a freighter back to Japan um, because I was determined to live in Japan. And uh, when I got to Japan uh, the second time, uh, I realized I had the wrong kind of visa. Uh, I didn't read, I didn't know anything. I was so naive about so much, but I had the wrong kind of visa. So I lived in the slums of Osaka. Um, through the uh, 56 until the spring of uh, 56. And um, I was writing poetry. I was going around uh, all these, uh, the slum area, with, uh, recording my things, writing stories about uh, immediate post-war Japan, and things like that. And I realized I couldn't stay in Japan because I had the wrong kind of visa. So I uh, then wrote to the University of Hawaii, asking if they would accept me as a student because I had a GI Bill of Rights. I figured I could uh, I could study Japanese at the Hawaii, and so that's what I did. I went to Hawaii and stayed there for the next five years. And while I was uh, at the university studying Japanese, then I began to translate uh, poetry. I took a course 
uh, from Ukiyo, Uehara was his name, and uh, in Japanese literature and English translation. And um, he would put these poems on the board um, in Japanese and then try very painfully to explain what they were saying. Yeah. And uh, I was uh, sitting in the back of the class there, and I realized, you know, that I could, I could actually read Japanese a little bit by that time. And, uh, and then I had a pretty, pretty interesting uh, I could uh, really understand what he was trying to say. And so I would jot down basically translations because I had already internalized the Tonka poem in a 575, even in English. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I know that is a translation. That's a kind of a question of whether you should do that or not. But anyway, I did do it. And uh, so I could write, I could translate these poems as he wrote them on the board. And later I showed a bunch of them to him in class. He said, well, this is really amazing. These are real translations. And he said, in fact, he said, I can tell which poem was the original from your translations. I'm like, well, that's really good. Okay, that's one of the best compliments I ever had. So, uh, <laughs> so after that, then I published those in, uh, in student translations. But I got so interested in poetry uh, by the time I left Hawaii, uh, I had a master's degree, and my thesis was on the history of modern Japanese poetry okay. from the time the Western influence came into Japan with the, uh, the Romantic movement and the and, uh, and the uh, uh, and the uh, Dada's poets and so forth. Everybody was coming into Japan influence, and so there was a whole modern movement of the Japanese poetry that continued right on up. Uh, and I brought it up to uh, about the end of the Meiji period, about 1912. So uh, when, what, what did you do after Hawaii? Did you come back stateside? What was your first book of published translations in the U.S.? Okay, okay. What happened then, I applied for a Ford Foundation grant to go to Japan to basically translate Japanese poetry. And the Ford Foundation says, no, we won't send you to Japan, but we will go send you to any graduate school in the United States uh, if you want to continue studying at the graduate level for the uh, in Japanese literature. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I discussed that with some of my friends. I really wanted to go to Japan. I really didn't want to come back to the United States. But uh, an advisor of mine says, why don't you go to Columbia University? Donald Keene is there. And... Uh, and I knew Donald King's work as well. I could go there and study with Donald King and really learn translation method. And, uh, and so that's, that's what I did. I accepted the, uh, the uh, Ford Foundation grant. It was a full ride, uh, paid for everything. And I went to Columbia University to study with Donald King. And while I was there, he began to give me little books of poems and things of the most contemporary Japanese poets uh, he was getting requests from uh, different uh, literary magazines in the United States, Poetry Northwest, uh, Tri-Quarterly, different things like that, asking him for translations. Well, he would farm them out to me. Uh, I was interested in that uh, contemporary poetry and uh, could translate it very well, uh, quite well. Yeah. So, uh, And then, then what happened is uh, basically then uh, I... Uh, uh, after that, I uh, applied for a Fulbright to go to Japan to translate the work of Hagiwara Sakatado. And then he is the father of modern Japanese poetry. He's the one that really uh, was able to solidify the, all the uh, different things that were coming into Japan at the time, the spoken language, free verse, all that. And he uh, did that uh, in the... Uh, uh, you know, in the uh, you know long before the war, yeah. and he was a major influence of all these other poets like Tony College and Todd and so on. So I translated uh, the uh, the first book, successful book of modern poem, uh, the uh, Howling at the Moon by Hakuhara Sakatada, but I've never published it. Oh. I've, I've never published it. There's I've been other. I've been very slow at getting my things up. And sometimes uh, other people have published works and so forth. But anyway, that got me started. 
Then from there, I begin to explore other poets after Hagiwara Sakatai. And what happened was, at one time, uh, becoming ahead, um, I decided to do an anthology of uh, modern Japanese poetry that went from Hagiwara Sakatai down to the most uh, recent poets. Uh, this is uh, getting into the post-war, uh, World War II period. And um, I went to Japan <clears throat> and uh, talked to a number of scholars, poets, uh, translators, different people about some of the more significant poets uh, that were there. I went to bookstores, bookstore owners, and so on, and I began making lists of uh, all the poets that everybody. And there was one name that kept popping up on everybody's list, and that was Tanikawa Shuntaro. Yeah. So I kind of dropped my my plans. Uh, it's a long story, but anyway, I I dropped my plans eventually to do the anthology and focused on Hagiwa, uh, no, no, on Tanikawa Shuntaro, okay. and uh, then I trained. So then my first real book of uh, of modern Japanese poetry translations was Tanikawa Shuntaro. Okay. Well, let me uh, ask. Uh, uh... A, a question about translation. I asked this a couple of days ago when I was speaking with uh, a fellow who translated uh, uh, Russian poetry, uh, Robert Tracy. Do you have you well? Have you only translated Japanese poetry? Then have you translated any other languages? Uh, no, no, no. I heard your question about that. It was very interesting for me to hear uh, some of the other uh, uh, gentlemen talk about that. But no, I've uh, only translated Japanese. So do you do you find it more freeing to, to translate from a non-Roman alphabetic language, uh, you know, taking ideograms? Uh, do you think it's easier than, let's say, if you knew some French and tried to translate a French poet? Can you guess? Uh, yes, I did take a workshop one time in, uh, in, uh, in Antioch where I was teaching, and uh, it was a translation of a poetry workshop. And uh, we would do uh, class uh, uh, exercises and French and German and so forth. And it seemed to me that uh, it would be kind of hard to break away from that uh, without being too literal. It would be uh, it kind of, you know, there was this, it was to, we're in Japanese, basically it's a whole different act. And I can talk about the process of that that, that I went through, especially with Tanikawa Shuntaro, because uh, reading the Japanese in the first place is really, really difficult. Uh, you know, you've got 2,000 uh, Chinese characters, and each one of those has uh, a couple, at least, uh, sometimes up to many, it's 25 different pronunciations. It depends what, how it is in the context, what follows it, and so forth. And then there's two phonetic scripts. And so putting all that together in a uh, thing that says, it's a really slow kind of reading. But uh, once you get the concept of the poem. And one thing I like about Japanese poetry, it's very visual. Uh, you're not dealing with uh, you know, abstract concepts and so forth. It's a, usually you can picture it. So having a very visual mind myself, and Tanikawa and all the pictures for it always made it very, their poems made very clear pictures and uh, illustrators love them because of that. But anyway, once I could get the poem together in my head, find out what it is, find out the rhythm and uh, the, uh, the visual imagery of it and so forth, then translating uh, became uh, just a kind of a recreating, uh, you know, in my own language. You know, a rule of thumb was, uh, you know, if this guy was writing in, in English, uh, you know, how would you say that? You know, if, yeah. if you're writing in a in Midwestern dialect of English, how would you say that? And that, that, that was was kind of a rule of thumb for me. But well, but uh, to get back to that, uh, what I did with working with Tony Kala, uh, I was asked him then to record for me uh, his poems before I translated. So you, I, so you actually I, knew him. You you know him. What? Oh, I know him very well. Very okay. well. And uh, as I begin to uh, uh, translate him, he got invited to uh, to an international poetry festival at the uh, uh, the Library of Congress. Okay, there they picked uh, different poets from different countries, and he he was uh, representing Japan. Well, they asked him if he had a translator, and he said, "Well, Harold Wright's been translating uh, some of my poems." So I got invited to go to, to the Library of Congress as well. Mm -hmm. So I was able to go there. 
and meet him. Or no, I'd already met him in Tokyo. We, we discussed his work, and he already started translating. But we started doing these readings in the uh, Library of Congress, and I realized that this guy was really a performance poet. He put so much into his poetry, uh, emotion, and body language, and all these things. He just really got to tell me, oh, that's really, really wonderful to watch. And so I began to then play around with my translations and ask him, before I translated a poem, to record them for me. Uh, and sometimes uh, I could even watch him recording to see what kind of thing he was doing. But anyway, at the Library of Congress, and he could read this poem in Japanese. I would follow a translation, and I could not only kind of imitate his performance, uh, okay, really turned out a, a really decent translation. So it was both the the performance aspect of it I was translating. Uh, but after that, I just, everything that I, I uh, just, I, I had a copy, a hard copy in a book, but I would ask him to translate it, and I would ask him to read it if I could. Uh, and sometimes I had video. Um, I had an old uh, port a pack uh, video camera at the time, and um, I even uh, took video of him and watch him perform that. And that really helped with my translation. Yeah, I would, I would think that if you could see the, into, or the inflections and intonations that aren't available on paper, it would help you. Absolutely. And uh, one of, just a very concrete uh, example of that is he, uh, uh, he uses a lot of humor and irony. Yeah. And I could hear that in the Japanese, and then I could do something in my English that helped me do that. But... Uh, <laughs> seeing humor on the page, just saying it's a sly humor. Yeah. <laughs> right, and you, you can see that online, on the internet, you can see people trying to make jokes, but because it's written and you have no sense of what the person's looking like or what the inflection of their voice is, most time humor like that will fall flat. But if you hear it or you see a video of it, you can get it. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Let, uh, me, just, uh, let me just ask you, have you translated Japanese prose as well? Uh, not very much. It, uh, again, reading is hard for me. I, I am dyslexic. Ah. And to read something, takes a, I got very good at dictionaries. <laughs> I'm looking up words in dictionary. But, oh, okay. uh, no, I have not read things. Uh, sometimes I, in the past I've been requested to do something or I had to do something for my academic work. But, uh, well, let me, let me just ask you, in the earlier interview I did with the two other translators, I talked about what's known as embodiment theory and uh, trying to create artificial intelligence, wherein uh, computer science scientists, uh, to try to mimic the human brain, they've tried to make robots that have artificial, some kind of intelligence, have hands and things to grasp, because it's difficult to try to mimic human behavior or human thought when you're just a bunch of alg algorithms. So I wanted to ask, if you're if you're like listening to these Tanakawa performances or watching a video of him perform or being there live, when you go then and you have this in your mind or you're listening to it as you're doing the translations, do you somehow sort of slip into a, a Japanese mindset rather than the outsider mindset? Is there is there you know is there the 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 American Harold and then the, the sort of the Japanese Harold that does the translation? Uh. No, I expect it's a tight war. Uh, or it's, it's basically a, uh, a tight war act that I'm kind of looking at one way and looking at the other and not wanting to fall off the middle middle thing. The, uh, you know, my job as a translator, uh, always felt, was to make Tiny Kawa look good. Yeah. Okay? To capture the best I could in my own language. Uh, so that was... Uh, uh, now, I did have the experience one time where I was living in Kyoto uh, doing work on my second book of Tanikawa, and I got very much involved with a, the traditional Japanese Tanga. Uh, I met a Shinto priest that was interested in the old Tanga, and so while I was doing the, both these things, but he said to me, uh, there's a class being taught in Tanka writing 
over at one of the Shinto shrines. He says, why don't we do that? I said, I've never written anything in Japanese. Uh, I, I don't know if I can do it. He said, oh, yeah, you're Japanese. But, uh, so we went over and took this class in traditional, classical tanka writing. And, the, oh, that was a lot of fun for me. <clears throat> and I found I could write tanka that were acceptable by the teacher and the class and so forth. And, uh, but when I tried to translate them, I couldn't translate my own work. <laughs> I realized I had slipped over into a Japanese mindset. And I, I was very confident. I thought I could translate anything. But I yeah. really couldn't translate my own work. That, 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 because I, I was some depth of my mind that it it, it became Japanese at that moment. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, and uh, one other final point I want to just ask you about that, that I've asked the other fellows too. Um, how about things like slang and metaphor from one language to another? I would assume that with Tanakawa, he could help you because if, if something was boldly stated as A, it might actually be you know uh, a metaphor for something that, that has no equivalent in English. Uh, yes, 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 of course. Uh, the, I was able to contact him, uh, even when I was working on my second book in Kyoto, we were on the phone a lot, and I would say, you know, you know, page 69, line 3, there's a, uh, there's, there's a word here. Uh, another aspect of the Japanese language, uh, I have to say, is that uh, Japanese is a very, very vague language. There's no articles, okay, no specific articles, no ideas and those. Uh, and uh, there's no distinction between plurals and singulars. Uh -huh. So if you have a line like uh, uh, Kini Toriganagu, which I could translate as a bird is singing in a tree, I really don't know from the written text whether that's one tree, one bird, or a whole flock of birds. Okay, there's a famous uh, Basho um, uh, you in a withered tree, a crow is settled. Evening and autumn is kind of a translation. Yeah. But there's been debate over the centuries whether that's a flock of crows, <laughs> one crow, how many birds, and different illustrators. Okay, there's another, there's a whole thing of, uh, of, of illustrating uh, haiku and so forth. Um, uh, illustrators have had to paint pictures of a whole bunch of crows up there. So, yeah. so calling up Tanikawa and asking him specifically, I think. Um, there are uh, different slang things that I would ask him in, and I would come up with, uh, with, uh, with, with you know, my own equivalent. Uh, 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 of, of different slang, you know, you know, sexual references and so forth. And, you know, I had to uh, be careful what I was coming up with, but, uh, you know, play around with that. Right. But and it, in the Basho poem you mentioned, it, it's it's important, too, because uh, if you, if it could, it could turn what the poem might be, because if you're talking about a singular crow, it's more likely to be a symbolic crow, whereas if you're seeing uh, multiple crows, it might be a more naturalistic poem. So I think that's absolutely correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, well, let me let's wrap up this uh, segment uh, about the the translation, and let's get uh, into talking about uh, some of the things you've done in more recent times, including uh, storytelling uh, and your website. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we return. Back with Harold Wright, and in our first segment, we talked about his career in poetry and translation. In this segment, I want to focus on some of uh, his later work, which I only found out about when I was looking him up to uh, do a show on poetry translation, and that's storytelling. Now, I've spent about 30 years in the arts. So when I hear a term like storytelling, that, that says to me people who like stand up at cabarets and will go for five or ten minutes telling a story, sometimes a comic story or... It could be a dramatic story. Uh, it could be a moral story or a didactic story. Is that uh, basically what you do? Are you, is it more performance when we're talking storytelling, Harold? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, so the Franklin, yeah. And the, uh, I'm, I'm hearing sound here. Oh, uh, I, I don't, it seems okay to me. Okay. okay. Yeah, go ahead. It is just kind of an echo. Uh, but anyway, let me, let me just talk. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, John. I was coming back from Japan and I was reading a, one of the magazines, the airline magazines, and was, there was an article about the storytelling revival that was happening in Jonesboro, Tennessee, that had been going on for a number of years. And basically what this was about was a group of Appalachian uh, storytellers who were trying to revive this town, find something interesting to do. So uh, they... Uh, uh, Basically, it's been going on for over 30, 40 years now. But uh, I, I can't remember the exact date. But anyway, uh, the storytelling revival uh, really sounded interesting to me. And so what happened was I uh, uh, got back and I had just uh, uh, got married to my present wife, Jonathan Arvain. And uh, we decided to take a, a trip down to Jonesboro, Tennessee, to see what that was about, because she and I both grew up in, in Appalachian kind of uh, uh, families. They told stories, family stories. Uh, we didn't debate things very much. We told uh, stories about different people in the family. And um, so anyway, we thought we'd be interested. So when we went down and saw that, and there were all the different kinds of stories that you were talking about, inclu including uh, folk tales, of, of different uh, uh, kinds, and uh, so we uh, uh, <coughs> really enjoyed that for the, a long weekend. And coming back, we said that looks like that would really be fun to do. Uh, maybe we should try that. So we found out there was a local group in uh, not too far from Dayton, and we joined that and began to tell a story. Since that time, with the uh, storytelling revival. There are now statewide organizations in every state in the There's every major city yeah. has all kinds of uh, uh, storytelling groups, you know, uh, and uh, guilds of different kinds. So and so the, the stories that are told are the personal stories, the Mothman stories, the folk tales, there's tales for children, uh, and going to, uh, you know, uh, retirement communities uh, telling stories. And, uh, uh, environmental groups invite me to tell stories. Uh, so I would, I would think this is related to folklorism then? Uh, I think so, I, but I haven't made a study of, uh, of folklore and how it is. But, uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, there are people that, uh, that, that can write what they're thinking about, right? So, uh, so you primarily now are doing more uh, of the storytelling than the poetry. So do you go to like, uh, when do you get invited to uh, fairs? Do you get invited to uh, uh, co community colleges? Or did you teach uh, classes? And uh, talk, talk about that for a bit. Uh, yes, yeah. We uh, uh, get invited to different kinds of uh, uh, festivals. There's a uh, very large uh, uh, network of festivals. Um, different people... Uh, the storytelling uh, events. Uh, we, we get a circus tent. Uh, it's very much like the old Chautauqua kind of thing, where yeah. uh, the, uh, the, the, the community will, will gather uh, for their storytelling. We do it in libraries. We go to schools uh, and all that. So that's what I do when I'm kind of on the road. Uh, when I'm at home, I write poetry. Uh, I do write poetry about every day, it's just, a, just, just a hobby kind of thing. And uh, I translate, I still translate. And uh, one of the projects I've been, I've been working with is the translation of the Emperor Meiji, uh, 1868 to 1912. And he was a very prolific poet. And uh, I got interested in him when I was in Tokyo in uh, 19... Uh, uh, 1964, during the, uh, the Tokyo Olympics, I got a call from the Meiji Shrine asking me to translate a number of the Emperor Meiji's poems um, for the, the Olympic guests. And uh, so I did that. Then I was invited back to Japan to translate um, a group of poems for the 70th anniversary 
of his death, and uh, that was published in Tokyo. And uh, then we were working on this large project of 300 and some poems of the Informating with the, uh, there was a committee of the uh, uh, chief priest of the Meiji Shrine, or the, the soul of the Emperor Meiji is a <laughs> There was uh, the, uh, the tutor to the crown prince, uh, of, who is now the emperor uh, of Japan, and uh, the uh, grand chamberlain <laughs> of the imperial household. And uh, so I was invited to join these three and uh, to get a collection of a large collection of information these poems. And I said I would translate them. But we could not find a publisher, even in Japan. They said it, it would cost too much. It would be it would be uh, too splendid of a book to publish. It. <laughs> so anyway, the project was dropped. Uh, but I had I had the poems that we had selected, and I'm still working on. And I just finished the last one last winter. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, let's, let's... With, with the storytelling. And then uh, so during our weekends, I think we go out and tell stories and. When I'm, when I'm sitting here at home, I, I translate poems or I translate uh, um, uh, folk tales. I love translating folk tales now. So, so now, I'll get these drop. Uh, are those to, mostly Japanese or are they also American? Because I, I see on your website, Flesh Crawling Tales of Old Japan is one of the books that you and your wife did. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So uh, it's the old, uh, the, the, the old traditional. Uh, Tales, the old folk tales of, uh, of, of Japan. So are you considering yourself sort of the a latter day Lafcadio Hearn then? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna I'm someday I'm going I'm going to fill his shoes. That's my that's my life goal. Yeah. I also see that uh, that uh, you've uh, released CDs about uh, Japanese one called The Story of Japanese Poetry, uh, C D two volume book of haiku and whatnot. Um, so, uh, where do you record them at home, or do you go to a recording studio to record them? Or? No, it's really nice living in a small village like this. We have a, uh, uh, we do have a uh, very fine uh, recording uh, sound space. Uh, it's called uh, here in town. So uh, it's just down a few blocks away. So whenever we have a story, after we work up a story for our thing, we'll just go over to sound space and record it. Um, with him, and then he will archive this until we have enough for a uh, for a, uh, a CD, and to do the same thing with poetry. I decided translating poetry, and I was very impressed with the uh, the gentleman you had on uh, uh, talking about all the books they published and so forth. I, I have found that uh, uh, that that is really kind of hard, and uh, and not having the academic kind of support. And I'm not in you know teaching in a grad school. I was teaching an undergraduate college. And so I didn't have the, the uh, department or the colleagues or the whatever. You know, this is a town of 3,000 people. Uh, so anyway, I have been out there getting the bushes, trying to get my books published. So what I've been doing is rehaving fun with it. And uh, so I decided to go through all the translations I had done and pick out um, maybe 50 or 70 of my favorite ones and do string them together in a chronological order and call it the story of Japanese poetry. Mm -hmm. So starting with the Manyoshu, my favorite translation there, down to Tanikawa Shantou. <laughs> and uh, so that's, uh, that's a story of Japanese poetry. I think it's one or two volumes of CDs with a printed book that goes with it. Well now, are these, are these uh, anthologized stories all by other people or are they they're stories that you and your wife have uh, you know, created yourself? Uh, both. Uh, we uh, have both worked on our uh, all the childhood stories of our, our, our family stories. We have done collections of that. But right, so you have we, American stories as well as Japanese. Uh, personally, yeah, the, the ones. Yes, yes, yeah. Sometimes we do scary stories. But what I've done with the Japanese is go back and basically retell them in English. Yeah. Go back, and so that's. Um, you know, uh, scary stories, for example. You know, on different themes like that. So Halloween, we uh, we, we tell a lot of lot of, lot of stories. But there's a, a large place near here. It's a agri entertainment place, mm. where, you know, it's a farm place where they have you know hay rides and all that stuff. So, so we're the we're the uh, in house uh, storytellers for that for that for that, for that place, Young's Dairy in Yellow Springs, Ohio. Mm. Well, 
Well, let me talk a little bit about performance, because back in the 1990s, I was living in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, and I used to perform for a few years at something called the Balls Cabaret, and it was a free thing where people would go up, some would play musical instruments, I'd read my poems, people would do stories or act out a scene from a play they had written, and <laughs> I remember there was a fellow there who was a storyteller, his name was Lauren Nemi, I don't know if you've ever heard the name, but... Uh, he was he always had this ability that when he'd tell a story, he'd go on for three or four minutes and he'd always get the audience in his hand. And he wasn't he wasn't like Robert Redford good looking. He wasn't particularly charismatic, but he had a way with words and he'd tell the story. Once he got to about the fourth or fifth minute, he'd have the the he'd have the crowd in the hand and you're just ready for him to, to come home with the climax and bring it home. But then he'd go on for the sixth minute and the seventh minute and the eighth minute and the ninth minute. And you would just be like, when is he going to end this? And it was it, it's like that old unwritten rule that you never have the climax of a story less than 90% into the story. And so I want to I want to know when you're performing or when you've seen good performers, do you have those kind of little um, uh, rules, you know, about, you know, always needing, you know, don't go on too long. Know when you have... and. It, you know, depending on the audience, there are some audiences that maybe you have to shorten a story for a little bit because they're more impatient. Uh, yes. So let's talk a bit about the mechanics of performance, yes. if you will. Yes. Very, very good, uh, very good question. Yeah. One of the things I really liked about storytelling when I discovered it, it was that you didn't need paper. Uh, and I realized reading poetry, even something exciting like Tani Kalashintaro, okay, I've never been able to memorize poetry. And my, my translations, my own original poetry, and then we always had a piece of paper in front of me. Once I discovered storytelling, okay, then I had eye contact with the audience. And the kind of thing you're talking about, it's because it's an interactive art, because you're really communicating with the audience. Okay, you can tell these things. Now, if I see in the audience that somebody is getting a little bit bored, and it doesn't take very much at all in, their, in the way their eyes are, are looking at me, okay, then I can speed up that part of it, yeah. or I can add something a little bit more exciting like that. Okay, and if it's uh, too exciting, then I, gotta, <laughs> I can bring it down. But it's basically playing with the audience, uh, with the uh, and reading the art, it's an interactive art. And that's one of the things I really love. I think I've always been a very shy kind of kid that really uh, craved attention. I think I wanted to find ways to jump up and down in front of our audience and make noise. And, uh, and I think storytelling has really provided a very good, a very good outlet for me. Well, I, we mentioned earlier, you talked about um, uh, uh, teaching uh, writing. How about performance? Do you also give like workshops? Uh, have you ever like you know had a dozen people, uh, young people who may have wanted to uh, learn how to stand up and, and tell stories and whatnot? And how does that differ than say the writing workshops? Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, we've not quite done it in New York. We've done it uh, uh, in different groups. We, we we still do it. We just um, just a few weeks ago we were invited to the. Outdoor Education Center here, where they bring these young naturalists in to uh, to teach kids about nature, and uh, basically they're, they're storytellers. They're telling stories of nature. They're telling stories of trees and animals and so forth, and uh, even including folklore. And so, so they want to they they, they want to be able to tell their stories better. So they invited us to come over to do a uh, uh, a workshop. Well, you know, we, we, we teach them the basics. You know, stories have a beginning, huh? they have a middle, and they have an end. And uh, it's very nice to, as you were talking about the one example, sometimes you're expecting the end and it never comes. Yeah. I know people that time. <laughs> you got to have a very clear ending, uh, and it's got to come. <laughs> and it's the appropriate place. Um, there's different voices that you can do. So we usually have to uh, do, do different things with voices. You know, if you're, you're talking to me, you know, I, uh, you know, I tell a lot of folk tales about old men and old women. But I, uh, I, I, uh, it worked out very well with my wife and I because we did tandem telling. And we do uh, uh, two of us tell one story. 
It was uh, also a lot of fun for us. And so, you know, when, when, when a Japanese folk, you know, as an old man and an old woman, uh, you know, we, we do we're pretty natural for the parts. Well, um, let me just uh, wrap up this segment with a final question about uh, uh, the performance aspect of the art. Um, do you find that it's that certain crowds are drawn more to say uh, folkloric tales, where some are drawn more to, to melodic tales. Other other crowds are better suited for dramatic story, and another one might be more for a soap operatic melodrama. And uh, do you sometimes get surprised if you go to perform and you and, and maybe you're geared to tell up? You know, stories of Paul Bunyan or Pecos Bill or that kind of folklore. Okay. It, it turns out that that they really want to hear about, uh, you know, the latest celebrity and, you know, some kind of goof on that. Usually the audiences that, that come to the storytelling events are really a mixed bag anyway. Yeah. And usually you can find someone in the audience that's really relating to them. You know, if they weren't innocent, then uh, maybe what we're doing, they probably wouldn't be there in the first place. So anyway, uh, so there's always someone, you know. Uh, I, you know, there may be a group of little old ladies there. They just love these, you know, these these sweet kind of things. And so, you know, I just keep them in my uh, in in my eyesight a little bit more than I I do the the old duffer over there who didn't want to be there in the first place. So there's a there's so there's a there's a way that you can uh, within the audience. But yes, uh, sometimes we advertise, uh, you know, what we're going to tell stories about. You know, we're invited to an organization for uh, for uh, uh, around Valentine's Day for love stories, uh, and anybody that comes there uh, <laughs> kind of knows what to expect. Okay. If you come out to our haunted barn around Yellow Spring, you know, but. Uh, uh, late October, uh, you, you better know what you're, you're going to listen to. We're going to have some very scary stories. Okay, well, let's wrap up this segment. In our next segment, uh, we'll, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, your wife, how you met, met her, your, uh, your performance with her, the website, and then uh, wrap things up with a closing remark. And we'll do that in a moment. In this segment, I want to talk with uh, you, Harold, uh, a little bit about your wife, because uh, when I first looked you up to find find you, hoping you were still alive and kicking uh, to do the poetry translation show, uh, I found uh, your website, which I will have linked below uh, this video. Uh, it's called jonathanharold.com. So tell me a little bit about your wife, uh, Jonathan. Was she a poet, a storyteller, a writer? How did you meet her? Did you meet her in Japan? What, what not? Okay. Uh, yes. Um, she grew up in Missouri and uh, as a, a rural, uh, you know, Appalachian kind of background, uh, storytelling. I grew up, uh, my parents are from uh, Appalachia, Ohio, uh, Southern Hills of Ohio. And so we had kind of an affinity of, uh, of cultural background there. But anyway, uh, I had been, uh, I had been isolating my poetry and so forth, and I was uh, uh, between, you know, relationships. And uh, I uh, always enjoyed workshops and different things like that. So coming back, I went to the Antioch Writers Workshop, uh, which takes place right here in town. And uh, writers come from all over the country to uh, present workshops. People come here and write and so on. So I decided to just brush up my poetry skills. And I took the uh, poetry and writing uh, workshop, which is Antioch Writers, uh, one year, but it was around 1990. And, uh, there was this real nice lady sitting there writing poetry, and uh, she had uh, come from, uh, uh, she'd been living in northern Ohio, working in uh, uh, mental retardation. I think she was an executive or some kind of uh, agency uh, there, and she was uh, be, uh, looking looking for <laughs> new things to do. Okay. So hold on, yeah. Harold, 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 hold on. Uh, your 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 thing is breaking up. Let me uh, let me just pause, 
a pause this here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna hang up and call you back so we get a better connection because your 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 face was sort of pixelating. Hold on, let me just get it rolling again here. Uh, All right. Okay, so okay, uh, go ahead, Harold, if you could continue. Sorry. Uh, anyway, I uh, came back out uh, from Japan, and uh, I wanted to go to the Antioch Writers Workshop, and in the Antioch Writers Workshop there was this uh, one lady. Uh, yeah, age-appropriate lady uh, who uh, uh, wrote very interesting poetry. And I became very interested in her. And uh, uh, she always claimed that uh, she liked me because I listened. I listened to her poetry. So anyway, it wasn't very long until I, uh, a romance started and we wrote poetry to each other and finally got married in 1990. And uh, then it was there together we discovered uh, the whole world of uh, storytelling. And uh, uh, as I say, I had found out about the, uh, the whole storytelling revival that was taking place in Jonesboro, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of our early trips together, we went to Jonesboro and uh, saw uh, one of these large uh, storytelling festivals where like, I think that year, 8,000 people came from all over the country uh, in different circumstances. Now, let me, uh, just ask, let me just ask, was that, I, I remember reading something that Johnny Cash and June Carter Cash were somehow involved with storytelling. Was that the festival that they sponsored? Because I know they had sponsored something like that. Uh, tell me the name again. June Carter Cash and Johnny Cash, the singers. Uh, yes, 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 okay. Uh, no, I am not familiar with that. No, no, they no, were okay. not involved with well, that. Okay. This is the Jones but okay. uh it Go. was very inappropriate. There are people like them that come to these things, but they're yeah. not. No, not, okay. Go I ahead. don't remember them coming. All right, okay. we'll continue. But anyway, uh, yeah, so we decided the story down. So this is one of the things we did then. And uh, we even taught classes in storytelling at Antioch together. Uh, uh, I was teaching Japanese and things, but at Antioch, they're always with their new exciting classes. Kind of so, so we were able to then uh, start taking classes at A and and and, and, sort of and we had a very large group of students who became kind of a uh, followers of us, and we had uh, we met often and, and and told stories and translated stories, and the, the language students would translate stories from different uh, from, from French and German or whatever. Well, uh, so uh, after that, you know, we. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we met and got married and very happily are still married. So um, how long have you had the website, uh, JonathanHarold.com? Oh, she knows numbers better than I do. Uh, uh, it goes back probably, I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess 10 or 15 years. But. Okay. Um, now, do, do you both write the books together or uh, do you... It, do you when you when you uh, put out a bo book of say uh, uh, translations of, of uh, stories? Do you handle one aspect of it? And she handles the other ones, or do you do them together? Or do do you do one story, she does another story? I uh, know the uh, usually it works out like you're referring to the Japanese stories. Um, you know, I'm uh, I, yeah, I I'm the one who read uh, you know I can read Japanese. So anyway, the uh, I do a, like a, a draft of, uh, of of a story, and we pass it back and forth, and uh, and she's much better at uh, uh, at the final proofing and the and the editing and, and, and finding my mistakes and yeah. Yeah, polishing. How about uh, the performance aspect of it? You said that you perform together. When you perform together, do you do one of you act as sort of a Greek chorus, or is it more like, uh, do you do mostly comedic performances together, or more dramatic, or what? Uh, all, the, all, all that. Um, uh, sometimes, uh, when we're going to do a story, if we decided, we both perform solo, and we uh, perform in tandem. When we have a story that we think will work as a tandem story, uh, we basically print this story out, look at it, and then using a, uh, you know, a, a highlighter, uh, define the different parts of it that we're comfortable with. Uh, sometimes there's a narrator, 
Uh, and it seems like in many cases, uh, I do the narrator part. If there's a gender distinction in the story, then it's pretty easy to break down. Um, and then uh, we usually say to start the story together, sometimes by um, using set phrases like mukashi, mukashi, harotokoro ni, uh, long ago in ancient Japan or something like that. I may start with that. She does the, the English of that. And we, uh, then we end up usually with saying something in unison, like a chant. Okay, that's usually our, our ending. Um, you know, maybe something simple like, and they lived happily ever after, or never did that again, or something like this. Simple thing. You know, puts a puts a final uh, period to the to the piece. Uh, well, let's let's talk about uh, uh, you know the legacy here. And uh, uh, if you could if you could tell one story, uh, you know what what kind of story would it be? And would it be being invited to the White House to tell it in front of the president? Would it be uh, you know telling it in front of uh, a group of children, or going to speak in front of the Emperor of Japan and tell a story? What 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 is your sort of like Babe Ruth moment, if you could. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, actually, I, I have a story just the other day. I walked into the, the uh, Unitarian Fellowship, and uh, they said, we're talking about, uh, the speaker is going to be talking about uh, 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 the perils of growing old. Do you know any stories that uh, deal with the perils of aging? And I said, well, let me take off my hat and think about it. So I took off my hat and I said, yeah, I know a story. I'm very <laughs> And so I told him this story. Once upon a time in Japan, there was an old man and an old woman, and they were getting up in years. And oh, it was so hard to do their chores. They, they were, <laughs> you'd go cut wood, and his back would hurt. He died. Uh, and uh, she would go down to the river to do her laundry, and uh, her back would hurt. He died. Uh, well, uh, one day he said, I have to go in the, in the mountains and uh, cut a bunch of firewood. So he went up there and took his axe, cut you, cut you, cut you, cutting up his firewood. Oh, it was so hot. He was so miserable. He, uh, he, uh, uh, needed to drink water badly, so he uh, uh, said, oh, I forgot my gourd. I'm getting forgetful, too. This is terrible. Maybe I can find some water. So he went up in the mountains there, and pretty soon he heard techo 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 trickling on water, and he realized there under a big rock, there was a uh, 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 water was coming out, spring was coming out. So he took his hands, oh, made a cup like that. Oh, that was a glass of water. Oh, that's good. He felt much better. He went down the mountain, picked up that axe, cut you, cut you, cut you, cut you. He had a big pile of firewood. And then he went down the mountain home. What did old woman come out to you? That's a nice pile of firewood you have there. But who are you? Who am I? I'm the old man. No, no, no. You're not my husband. My husband is an old man. But you are a young, handsome man. What are you talking about? I, I, I guess I'm your old man. I'm your husband. Look, this coat, you made it yourself. Yeah, it's my husband's coat. Where did you get it? Did you steal it? How old is I'm your husband. Come on, you so he went over to where he washed his face in the morning, the sending kid. And he looked in there, he could see his reflection in there. Oh my goodness, there was a face, a face, a young man looking out of the water. But then he realized that was his face. That was his face when he was young. And so he told her, he said, Oh, I, I think I've become young. How did you do that? She said. I don't know. It must have been that water. I found the spring. I had some water. Maybe it was a kind of a magic water or something. Uh, oh, she said. I want to drink some of that water too. It's that's hard. Tomorrow morning I'll take you up there and you'll drink, and we can become young together. And so 
that night he went to bed, he slept so well. Oh, he slept so well. No aches and pains. And the next morning when he woke up, he woke up, he was a, 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 a really refreshed, and he looked up, the old woman was gone. Oh, where did she go? I bet she was so anxious to drink that water. She's already up the mountain. I will find her. She can't walk very long. So he went up looking for her. Obasan! Grandma! Obasan! Obasan! He got up there. She shouldn't be up there by herself. He got up to the place where he'd been cutting firewood. Obasan! Obasan! He looked around. He was terrified. Maybe a bear or something had gotten her. No, I don't. He went on up the trail. Pretty soon he heard tekka, 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 the water. But he looked around. She wasn't there. Oh, my son! Oh, my son! She wasn't anywhere around. Couldn't believe it. He went over to the water. Oh, he was terrified. Maybe a bear had gotten there. She was nowhere around. But there beside the water was her kimono. Just her kimono. Oh, this is terrible. Oh, it's only the bear got her. So he went over to pick up the kimono. And there inside the kimono was the cutest little baby he had ever seen. <laughs> oh, grandma, grandma, baby grandma, you drank too much water. <laughs> so with that, he picked her up, carried her home to raise her. Until she got big enough, he could marry her again. <laughs> well, that's a good story. Um... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> anyway, that's a, that's the kind of story that uh, would uh, fit in with children love it. Yeah. Uh, 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 old people really love it. <laughs> anyway, I have a lot of fun with it. Yeah. So that's what I'm doing now. Well, let, let's end this. Uh, let me just give you a final uh, minute or two, just if you want to say anything uh, else uh, about uh, what you plan to do, hopefully in the next year or two. Do you have, uh, you mentioned you're still working on translations. Uh, mm -hmm. What what What's on the, the near horizon for you? Uh, basically, it's a day-by-day -day thing. I, uh, up, I, do, I try to do something literary every day. I write a poem. I just uh, completed... Uh, Three little chapbooks last winter. <laughs> uh, I just kind of sit in my chair and look out and see, see something that inspired me to write, write, write something. And uh, translation, I would like to do something with that, uh, with the, the May Emperor Meiji poems. I, uh, I've decided just to uh, uh, maybe just make a Kinko copy and send it off to the Meiji Shrine uh, just for their archives. I, I will do that anyway. Uh, because uh, the chief priest himself uh, asked me to translate them, and I always feel guilty that I didn't ever do it. So uh, dealing with some past guilt right now, you know, I will get that off to the major shrine. Uh, I also write for the Yellow Strings News and New Newspaper, and I have a very interesting little column I do. It's um, uh, it's just off the head kind of thing. I write about anything. It's a small town. Uh, you know, maybe nature, maybe some political thing to put on. But I always find a chunk of poem, okay, that um, that fits the subject matter. And I always end with a translation of a chunk of poem in these uh, little things. And um, they seem to be appreciated. People are always kind of amazed how I can drag out some kind of political thing and find an ancient you know, thousand-year-old poem that kind of kind of meets the subject. So, so I've been doing that. But you know, like I've told people at academic uh, stuff, you know, I have more readership in uh, in uh, in the Yellow Springs News than okay. I've ever had in some of these academic journals. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for doing this interview, Harold, and. Uh, uh, thanks for your contributions to literature and storytelling. And uh, anyone who wants to find out more about you, as I mentioned, you can see the link below this video that I have. It's jonathanharold.com. Uh, and if you enjoyed this interview with Harold Wright, next week I'm going to be doing my final thir uh, third of three interviews on the nature of existence. I did one with a philosopher. I did one with the theologian. And next week, I'll be talking with a physicist. So that should be interesting as well. Again, Harold, thank you for your time and good luck.
Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much.